Upon spotting the iceberg, the crew steered the Titanic to the left, stopped the engine, and they even reversed it, thinking that it would reduce the ship's speed. Did you know that reversing the engine was their biggest mistake? Ships turn when their rudders rotate. The faster the water flows around the rudder, the greater the turning force it produces. When you spin the propellers in reverse, they push the water in the opposite direction. Can you find out what's the issue here? The water pushed by the propeller flows directly over the rudder and opposes the main water flow. This means the water flow speed around the rudder suddenly decreases, and the rudder then produces a much lower turning force. With such a reduced force, the Titanic couldn't turn to the left as it was required to. You know what happened next. The gushing water began to flood the watertight compartments. The captain quickly understood the gravity of the situation and ordered the closing of the watertight doors in the compartments. During flooding, if these doors are open, the gushing water would immediately reach all the compartments. These are smart doors. If the water level rises, they'll close automatically. In case of a water level increase, this float moves up. The door is held in position with the help of the clutch. If you disengage the clutch, the door will fall down automatically because of its weight. When the float moves, a bellweight mechanism disengages the clutch. This mechanism could be activated by a solenoid valve as well, which was controlled from the bridge. To make sure that the door would not fall down abruptly, they added two shock absorbers. However, the engineers made sure that in the last one foot, the door would free fall. The high speed of the fall would make the door slam and shut completely. The engineers behind the Titanic were extremely clever, right? Even more clever was the way they handled internal communications. In all the Titanic movies, you might have seen this beautiful device. This is the engine order telegraph, the heart of the communication technology on the Titanic. If the first officer who is on the bridge of the ship wants to reduce the engine speed, he'll move the lever from full to slow. When he does that, the cable within the device moves. This movement is transmitted about 250 meters via long pipes and finally reaches the engine room. At the engine room end of this cable is another engine order telegraph. The cable's movement at the other end spins the indicator plate of this telegraph. The engineer in the engine room sees this command and responds by moving the lever to the matching position on the indicator plate. When the engineer does this, the indicator needle on the bridge side automatically moves to the lever's position. This means the lever of the engine room telegraph and the indicator plate of the bridge telegraph are connected via another long cable. In short, two cables were used for transmitting information between the telegraphs. Obviously, after acknowledging the order, the engineer still has to go and reduce the engine speed. At the bridge side of the Titanic, there were four such telegraphs two for engine control, and the other two for controlling the boilers. Yes, the boilers were also controlled by similar telegraphs. Have you ever wondered why Titanic's masts were so tall? If you look carefully, you can see an antenna between these masts. This was the main duty of the masts, to support the antenna. Just follow this cable of the antenna, and you will enter the Marconi Telegraph Room of Titanic. You might have seen in movies the radio operators pressing this telegraph key continuously but rhythmically. When they press it, a spark is generated in this gap. This was a popular long-distance communication technology of that time called the spark gap telegraph. When the operator presses the key down, the electric circuit is completed and a spark is generated in this gap. The spark gap telegraph was unable to produce continuous signals. The operator used it to produce either dot or dash signals. The spark, along with these conductors, produces a dipole antenna, and the antenna radiates signals. There were two Marconi T-type antennas connected with four horizontal wires. These traveling electromagnetic pulses could be detected by another ship's antenna, and on the receiver side, a long strip with many dots and dashes would be printed. These were Morse code symbols. From this sequence of dots and dashes, the operator had to decode each letter and finally the message.
The main radio operator of the Titanic was John George Phillips, 25 years old. On the morning of April 14th, Phillips received a warning signal from RMS Coronia regarding a potential iceberg threat in Titanic's path. After some time, a similar telegraph warning signal was received from the SS Californian operator with the exact location of the iceberg field. SS Californian was the nearest ship to the Titanic, just 16 kilometers away. Their message even mentioned that they themselves were stuck in an iceberg field. The SS Californian operator received a shocking message back from Phillips. Shut up, shut up, I am working Cape Race. The Titanic radio operator was supposed to immediately pass such crucial messages to the bridge, but Mr. Phillips didn't do that. His radio telegraph was capable of communicating with the bridge. The bridge had a Marconi room as well. After receiving Phillips' reply, the SS Californian crew shut down their radio devices. Their duty time was over. The lookouts were the first to spot the iceberg, and it was at a very short distance. They were supposed to work with binoculars, but on Titanic's maiden voyage, the binocular case went missing. The story might have been different if the lookouts had their binoculars. We already talked about the engine reversal and how it affected the ship's turning ability. Let's prove this experimentally. We made this tiny but unique board for this experiment. This board is mainly powered by these wheels. But it has a pair of propellers as well to add its motion. I can even change the spin of the propellers. If the propellers spin in this direction, they aid motion of the board. When the propeller spin reverses, they oppose the board's motion. But the main thing to observe here is how the water is flowing around the rudder in these two cases. The propeller induces water flow in the same direction of the main water flow in the first case. In the second case, it is in the opposite direction. Now the main part, the turning ability of the ship in these two cases. I have set the rudder at an angle. In the first case when the propellers throw the water in the same direction of the main water flow, the board takes a turn with a good angle. Now the second case, the only change here is I have flipped the spin of the propellers. The board is starting to take a turn here it could achieve only a small angle of 10. This proves that reversing the propellers reduces the ship's turning ability. Whether the crew had time to reverse the engine in such a short period is still a point of debate. However, both the British and US inquiries concluded that the Titanic did indeed reverse its engines before striking the iceberg. After puncturing the sidewalls of five watertight compartments, Thomas Andrews, the ship's main design engineer, realized that the ship would sink within one to two hours. Mr. Phillips started his frantic effort to communicate with all the nearby ships. This was the distress message he sent, CQD and SOS. Unfortunately, the nearest ship SS California didn't receive the distress message. Their radio equipment was already off. The Titanic crew even lit fireworks to attract the attention of nearby ships. The captain of SS California saw them, but he didn't realize it was a distress signal. He retired to his room, believing that a party was going on board the Titanic. Remember, SS California was just 16 kilometers away from the Titanic. RMS Carpathia, which was 107 kilometers away, received the CQD message at 12.25 a.m. They replied to Titanic, saying they were on the way. However, they would take four hours to reach the Titanic. Phillips knew the ship would sink well before that. He kept trying to connect with any other nearby ships. Even when the water was at knee level, he kept on trying. 
The captain had already instructed the radio operators to abandon the Marconi room and save themselves, but the radio operators risked their lives and continued to send CQD messages, hoping to connect with a nearer ship. The lifeboats on the Titanic were inadequate to save all the passengers. By the time RMS Carpathia reached the location at 4 a.m., the ship had already sunk. They were able to save 705 passengers. To understand the details of the Titanic tragedy, we should first learn about her watertight compartments and side plate assembly. Let's visit the Titanic construction site for this. This shipyard was owned by Harland & Wolfe Shipbuilding Company, UK. They owned the largest gantry cranes at that time. Workers are doing the finishing touches on the wooden supports needed for the ship fabrication, the slipway. You can see that one end of the slipway is much taller than the other. We'll understand the reason for this slope soon. The strong steel structure they're building now is called the keel, the backbone of the ship. Now the workers are constructing the famous double hull of the Titanic. Did you notice how they connect different metal parts? They use rivets. This hydraulic electric machine made their riveting job much easier. Even though the primary material of the ship was mild steel, the material used for the rivets was wrought iron. This choice was a big mistake. We'll explore why soon. Once the construction of the double hull was complete, the workers started the assembly of the skeleton of the ship. The gantry of Harland & Wolf was super useful throughout the construction phase. You can see how the gantry crane lifts materials from the rail wagon, moves them, and lowers them to the right location. Along with the assembly of the ship's skeleton, they also assembled the frames of the ship. Even the steel structure of the deck was constructed at the same time. Otherwise, the ship's sidewalls wouldn't stand strong. You can also see the construction of bulkheads. Thousands of rivets were used in this fabrication process. Now, you might guess what the issue was with the wrought iron rivets. Wrought iron becomes brittle at low temperatures. On that fateful day, when the iceberg hit the sidewall, the steel skin did not break. It deformed, but the brittle rivets broke and allowed water inside. After the construction of the skeleton, frames, deck, and bulkhead, this steel structure finally looks like a ship. Now, the workers are completing the construction activities on the upper deck, except for one region. We'll understand why this region is empty soon. Now comes the big day, the launch of the Titanic. You can see two more slipways constructed on both sides of the ship. The wedge-shaped wooden structure is fitted to the ship. The workers initially grease all three slipways. Now you know why they built the slipway slanted toward the ocean. These hydraulic triggers help Titanic to enter the ocean. The worker activates the hydraulic trigger and the push from both sides. Remember the wedge is fitted to the ship. The ship moves forward along the slipways. Slowly and gradually, the ship enters the ocean for the first time. A big day indeed. We know the ship is only half constructed. The remaining construction is done while the ship floats in the water. This floating crane is the main hero at this stage. Assembly of the boilers, steam engines, and funnels was done now. Even the interiors and lighting connections were completed at this time. What's left now is the assembly of propellers. For this purpose, the ship was moved to another dock with the help of tugboats. You may enjoy the details of how they fitted the propellers to the Titanic. Are the propellers exactly similar? No. You might have noticed that the blades of a propeller spin in the opposite direction. This means that to produce the thrust force in the same direction, one propeller should be the exact mirror of the other. The Titanic could generate electricity until her last moments. More precisely, the lights on the ship were on until just seven minutes before it broke in half. This is remarkable. Independent steam engines ran the Titanic's generators, and the ship used six such pairs. They all were kept at the stern of the ship. To keep the ship's lights on, all that was needed was a steam supply. 
please have a look at where the steam is supplied from. They start producing steam a few compartments away. Boiler number 6 immediately stopped the supply of steam when the gushing ocean water entered the compartment. Now, imagine what happens to the boilers when the ship starts to tilt and sink. Slowly over time, the boilers flood and they stop producing steam. However, the brave workers kept working in the boiler room. You can see here that since the generators are kept at the stern of the ship, they are not affected initially. When the ship reaches its maximum angle, water enters even the last boiler room, and the entire steam supply is cut. The gallant effort of the workers kept the ship alight until the last moment, making the evacuation easier. The steam supply was crucial for radio and ballast pump operations. They were used to reduce the level of the gushing water. The debris from the Titanic has already been significantly affected by the ocean environment over the past century. The iron and steel components of the Titanic will continue to corrode. Ultimately, the Titanic will continue to be a part of the ocean ecosystem, slowly disintegrating over the next thousand years, so the ship itself will no longer exist as a recognizable structure. When launched in 1912, the Titanic was the biggest passenger ship. How big is it compared to today's cruise ships, say, the Wonder of the Seas? This imaginary visual is an absolute treat for the eyes. Wonder of the Seas has more than double the passenger capacity of Titanic. But remember, Titanic was built more than 110 years ago. I hope the Titanic video was informative. And you may be aware that to produce such big videos like Titanic, the art revenue from YouTube is not sufficient. So please check out my Patreon page and try to support us. Take care. Bye-bye.